sudden you just you're just really out of it. The world is upside down. Oh. Okay. Um, got a few announcements to make before we get started. <laughs> And those are, first of all, there's a, tonight we're going into the book of Proverbs, and we're in our second study. We're going to go through the first six, seven verses dealing with the purpose, the purpose of Proverbs. Here's something that you should know. When you know the purpose of the scripture that's being taught, if you know the purpose of the book that's being written, um, Isaiah 55:11 kicks in. My word does not return void, but it accomplishes the purpose for which it is sent. So understand that when you know the purpose of it, then you have some solid ground to pray with. Okay? Got it? Turkeys for Tomahawk. Okay, strive is still going on. Um, if you want to donate towards the purchase of turkeys for Tomahawk families, you can donate online at... You got it, guys. You're well trained. Uh, or you can donate in a tithing envelope. Just make sure the envelope uh, is marked turkeys for Tomahawk. I will tell you that um, turkeys are costing a little bit more this year. Have you noticed that? It's quite a lot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, but the cost that is for us is not because of the supply line, supply chain problems or the out of control um, inflation. We're hiring a helicopter. And we're going to deliver the turkeys by helicopter. Okay. Um, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, go ahead. Did you know turkeys can fly? No. She's never going to sit in the front row. There you go. Yeah, WKRP Cincinnati, right? Les Nesman, right? Threw off turkeys out of the helicopter. He says, I swear I knew they could fly. <laughs> All right. <laughs> what a bunch. Yeah, there it is. Thank you, Paul. Um, now, on a serious note, if you are here, because we, you know, the supply chain is a real issue, inflation is a real issue, and wages aren't buying as much as they used to, and the Lord's been good to us here at Calvary Arrowhead. <laughs> Uh, through the tithes and the offerings that you've all been giving. So if you have a, a need for Christmas, we would, or Christmas or church, well, okay. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. <laughs> Please let us know because we would love to be able to supply you a, a turkey and such, okay? And a, a food box if necessary. So whatever you may need. And also, just FYI, um, there are some flyers in the back for St. Mary's. Turkey distribution and Vineyard North Phoenix food basket giveaway too. So don't go hungry this Thanksgiving, okay? All right, um, next, jewelry sales fundraising. Our own Yolanda Monterey. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's okay. It's all good. It's all good. Um, she is going to be setting up a table over here next Sunday after the 9.30 service so you can get some early Christmas shopping done at the jewelry table, all right? And all of the proceeds go to support CCA Outreach Ministries. And then, um, Women's Bible Study Potluck. Before the ladies take a break for the holidays, they will be gathering together on Saturday, November 20th at 9 a.m. for a breakfast potluck. All ladies are welcome to join and also anybody you would care to invite. Great time to um, fellowship and to show people that Christians aren't as weird as the news media makes us out to be. Even if you have not been able to attend regularly at the regular study, please come. It's important that you sign up, though, and you sign up where? Right, or <laughs> kiosk in the back too. Um, this is going to be a special potluck because uh, Vince has said that he's going to come and do some beat poetry and some interpretive dance. Speedos. <laughs> 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 well, I don't know. We might drop the speedos. <laughs> All right. And also speaking of the ladies' ministries, the Christmas brunch is coming up on December fourth at nine a.m. Cost is $15 per person, includes a full breakfast buffet catered by Cracker Barrel. Please register at CCC. All right, your friends and family also 
And if you want to host a table of eight, please mark that on your registration. I don't know what it means to host a table, but I'm sure the tables will appreciate it. All right. Church directory, if you call CCA your home, we invite you to join our online church directory. Participation is completely optional. And you set what information you want others to see. So if you just give us your initials and no phone number, you're good to go. All right. You should have received a message through your email with this invitation. Please check your junk or spam mail if you decide to reply. If not, please ail ma ail mail, email us at info at ccrohead.com. All right. We good? Let's all stand, please. If you have your Bibles with you, please open to the book of Psalm. Psalm 119, starting at verse 97. And we stand in honor of God's word, and we stand to prepare our hearts to receive from the Spirit of God this morning. Amen. Psalm 119, starting at verse 97. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. You, through your commandments, make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients, because I keep your precepts. I have restrained my feet from every evil way, that I may keep your word. I have not departed from your judgment. For you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts I get understanding. Therefore I hate every false way. This is God's word. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, what we do here today is very spiritual recognize and acknowledge your presence where two or more are gathered here you are in our midst and we desire lord god to be edified and built up and strengthened to be comforted to be challenged to know that we have been in the presence of god may the love of the saints be sweet this morning may father those who are here that have not tasted of you may they taste today and see that indeed you are good as many are here who would say that exact thing our god is good he is all the time good so please bless us as paul ministers to us this morning and i pray this in jesus name amen you may be seated all right mr paul would you come on up buddy yes. um, I have something to give you before we go any further. Vince already gave me a bunch of guitar players. <laughs> well, we have some people who heard of your your, mis your trials. Yes. Because remember, this is the last time last time you yep. spoke here. The very last time I spoke. <laughs> That's right, and it was all caused because you didn't have a guitar pick. Right? Yeah, you got 20 of them there now, right? You're right. Yeah, well, we're not done. Okay? <laughs> not um, done. Those, those of you who have a gift for Paul, would you come oh, out? look at this. Look at this. <laughs> this is unreal. By this, you will know. <laughs> Sky Miles. I'll use those. Cut right. up. This is so cool, Dennis. He warmed and he filled. <laughs> I am. All right, I ladies and know. gentlemen, Paul Clark. <laughs> Gonna make me cry, actually. So before I even pick up my guitar, I need to do a little housekeeping. And uh, didn't make it one minute. Sorry, I'm Mug's family, so I'm okay. So two years ago, when I was here, uh, I spoke on James one. Last second, changed my mind. The parking or not? The Holy Spirit changed my mind, and had me teach on James one. And it's on videotape. You can go back and look at it, or you want to call it, recorded. And I made light of the fact, for those of you who don't know what this is all about, that the night before I sang down in Tucson, I left my bag of guitar picks. 
And so the only thing I could resource to resource myself to was to cut up my hotel room key and make guitar picks out of it. And I literally said, you know, when you encounter various trials, I said, this is this guitar pick situation is not exactly life threatening. Not knowing that, and I don't need to, some of you may know the story, but uh, I went home to Kansas City and uh, got lined up for a routine stint procedure, which they just sedate you. They acted like it was a drive through oil change at Jiffy Lube. I'll be out in the afternoon, and, and by a couple of days later, I'll feel like I'm 21 again and all that stuff. But long, without getting into the long medical thing, I had a um, allergic reaction to the anesthetic of the lidocaine which uh, I knew going into it, I had it, but somehow they administered uh, a medication to me that I went anaphylactics and, and uh, code blue and, and died, basically. And uh, anyway, they revived me, but I didn't hit the stent all the way up my, to my heart, so they put a second stent in my leg while they were working on all this. And, and uh, of course, they put two more milliliters of septicane or tetracaine or candy canes. I don't know what kind of canes they were, but into my leg, your leg's a big muscle and it takes a while to get in your bloodstream, so 30 minutes later, off I go again into another anaphylactic episode. So, long story short, I hit the guardrail hard twice and should have left the planet, and I'm very, very thankful to be here this morning. So, uh, I had no idea that was gonna happen to me, obviously. And the night before I even posted on Instagram, I'm standing in front of the ER play or the, the operating room at the hospital, like, praise the Lord, you know, I got my jogging outfit on, like an all fit, and uh, not knowing it, you know, you, you don't know when your life's going to be required of you. So, I, uh, like I said, I'm very grateful to be here, but I wanted to turn the mirror around and say how very grateful I am to you guys, because uh, I know that you guys prayed for me, Dennis and Sherry are great friends. I look around the room and see people I've known since I've been coming to this church, and I'm really grateful for the way you cover me in prayer. Thank you, sister. Where's your man? <laughs> uh, that's a long story. So I just wanted, really wanted to just uh, give thanks for this fellowship and all the fellowships. I mean, I know it, uh, it was a battle. And I know that Satan wanted to take me out. And I know that God wanted me to go on. And, and I know that the prayers of the saints are mighty. So don't ever think that your little prayer session with Dennis was, you know, maybe making an announcement was just a blah, blah, blah. Those are arrows that uh, fight off the enemy. So uh, secondly, that uh, sort of debilitated me for quite a while. I was in and out of the hospital like 48 or 70 days or something, goofy like that, until COVID broke out, and all of a sudden I was instantly healed and sent home. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I wasn't. But in fact, just as, as crazy as it was, my roommate, the, the last day I was ever in the hospital, uh, I was admitted, I was taken to the hospital, ambulance, blah, 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 had this neuroscience test around me and then put into a room with another roommate. And I got in his room, my room finally at 2 o'clock in the morning, his TV was just blasting, I mean, like cranking loud. And I was through the curtain saying, hey, man, can you turn it down? Can you turn it down? Like for an hour, two hours. Finally, I just yelled, I don't mind confessing my sins here. Dude, shut it down! You know, I was like yelling at the guy. And, and um, Anyway, finally fell asleep around 4.30 or so, and at 6 o'clock, I was awakened to my bed being slammed against the wall, the curtain being pulled back, and his fl he was flatlined, and they worked on him, and he died right in front of me. So I hate to feel bad that uh, possibly the last words he heard on earth was, hey, dude, turn your TV down, <laughs> but <laughs> might have been me. So anyway, um, uh, some residuals from the whole thing, uh, you know, my brain affected a little bit, my brain waves and the way things function, and I had to kind of rebuild some neuropaths. That's what I'm working on still all the time right now. And uh, one of the things I have vertigo is that's I'm sitting down in a chair. I can stand up and play right now, but if I fall over, it would be embarrassing for you to pick me up. So it's easier for me just to sit down and just enjoy myself. So um, anyway, but it also, you know, COVID ended touring, so that was no choice. So I couldn't tour anyway because I couldn't walk into my driveway, so it wasn't much of a lifestyle change from my vocation, but it did cause me to start searching in the Lord in a new way and say, okay, God, what do you have for me? You've saved my life. Uh, you've pulled me out of the pit. What now? Where, where, are we, where are we going now? Do I just get a job at Costco and get insurance and benefits and just ride the wave out, or what do I do here, you know? But uh, the Lord just told me, he said, well, sell your house, downsize, 
become because the path is going to get narrower and we're on that path right now i mean as you can see the last two years the path is getting narrower and narrower and narrower. the options are getting less and less the more time you spend carrying around your bundle of all your things you think you need uh, not just uh, physically but spiritually uh, the lord will he'll find a way to make you lie down he'll find a way to lighten your load so you can go through that small crack and stay on the narrow path but in that, one of the things that uh, I did was I decided to sell my house and um, move to a new location. But I needed just one last thing to go with me. So I'd like to introduce to you Mrs. Clark. <laughs> 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 this is my wife, Heidi. And uh, she and I had been dating off and on for 15 years. She endured the instability of a wandering minstrel musician. Uh, we were geographically separated by 750 miles. And... Uh, have gone through just a lot over the last 15 years, on again, off again, on again, off again, like a light switch. But um, I just want to say truthfully, you know, uh, the Lord used that time to make me, to examine my heart. And not that it's all bad, but, uh, you know, I've been doing this for 51 years. So 1970, when I was an unlicensed pharmaceutical representative, you know, Jesus stopped me dead in my tracks and, uh, you know, changed my vocation to do this. You know, this is what I've been doing for the last 51 years. So, um, I'm going to try to keep my words short a little bit here. So, one of the things that I felt was really necessary was to sort of resharpen my axe. Uh, Ecclesiastes 10.10 10 says, if the axe is dull, one must exert more strength. Anybody going out and chop wood? Probably going to chop wood for me fireplaces down here in the wintertime, but... I know when the wind chill gets in the 50s, everybody freaks out down here. So, But, uh, you know, up where we live in Missouri, we moved. I, I bought an 1842 uh, stone log house, a uh, 14-acre spring-fed lake in a little town called Herman, Missouri. So I got 2,300 people. And this will tell you how small the town is. I walked into the bank. I gave away seven vinyl records to all the bank ladies in there and talked to them all and befriended them. And then got my car, drove three more blocks down to 4th Street to Herman Lumber, Walked in and asked for some rebar, where I could get some rebar in the back. He says, hey, uh, you the new guy with all the vinyl records? <laughs> I mean, it only gone four blocks. And had, that guy had already gotten a call from his wife and said that this guy came to the bank and gave me the vinyl records. So that phone call beat me down to Herman Lumber three blocks away. <laughs> so I had 3,005 people in my graduating class in 1969. Any class of 69ers here this morning? All right, man. Way to go. Uh, but we have 2,350 people in our town, so we're learning how to Living in a small town, it's, 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 it's really fun, actually, uh, to go from, you know, towns with six lanes of freeways in each direction. That's how I've lived my whole life. And then all of a sudden, living in a little town is really fun. So we have rush hour traffic, 315 to 345, mom's picking up the kids at school. And uh, we have one traffic light. No, do we have a traffic light? No, it's stop sign. Yeah, stop sign, 4th Street, yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's really, it's a lot of fun. Uh, it's a, a Germanic community that was built in the 1830s, and it's still four and five generation families rule the roost. And uh, there are a lot of believers there and uh, a lot of people that are love this country. So we're really uh, grateful to be uh, living in the little town we live in right now. We made a lot of good friendships and had a lot of fun things happen. This house is really fun, too. It's got a big wine cellar underneath it uh, built by Germans, you know, that they're so good at. And I'm converting it to my recording studio and a little event center right now. So that's a little bit of updating you just uh, what's happened to me since. So uh, it's good to be married. And it's good to be alive. And it's good to still be following Jesus. And uh, so, and I want to once again just thank Dennis and Sherry for their friendship and their, uh, he's my brother. <laughs> Love that guy. I'm just standing up for a second because I'm going to talk for three hours today, so you want to stretch your legs. So, this is a simple worship song we all know. Just to get us warmed up. Feel free to put your hands together. Yeah, 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 yeah. We stand and lift up our hands For the joy of the Lord is our strength We bow down, worship Him now How great, how awesome is He 
together we sing Everyone sing Yeah, yeah, yeah Holy is the Lord God Almighty Oh, the earth is filled with His glory Holy is the Lord God Almighty Oh, the earth is filled with His glory. Yes, the earth is filled with His glory. We stand and lift up our hands, for the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down, worship Him now. How great! How awesome is he, together we sing, everyone sing, yeah, 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 holy is the Lord, God Almighty, oh, the earth is filled with his glory, holy is the Lord, God Almighty, oh, the earth is filled with his glory yes the earth is filled with his glory well it's rising up all around it's the anthem of the lord's renown well it's rising up oh all around it's the anthem of the Lord's renown will it's rising up oh all around it's the anthem of the Lord's renown will it's rising up oh all around it's the anthem of the Lord's renown together we sing Everyone sing, yeah, yeah, yeah. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty. Oh, the earth is filled with His glory. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty. Yes, the earth is filled with His glory. Take it up. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty. Oh, the earth is filled with glory. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty. Yes, the earth is filled with His glory. Yes, the earth is filled with glory. Yes, the earth is filled with His glory. Holy is the Lord. Here's another old eagle that you can enjoy the presence of the Lord with. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. For He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, and the sheep of His hand, just the sheep. Of his hand. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. For He is our God. And we 
are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand just the sheep of his hand just the sheep of his hand yes the sheep of his hand Thank you, Lord God, for being our great shepherd. Jesus, you are the great shepherd. We thank you for your rod and your staff. Draw us back when we're near the edge of the cliff and hitting the guardrail, and, and also use it to bump our heads when we're just being sinful and away from your presence. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for leaves beside still waters and green pastures. And thank you for making us lie down. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We praise you this morning. We appreciate you. And Jesus, we thank you for sending us the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we honor you right now. You are a person. You're not a thing. You're a person. Speak to me right now. The words you want to speak to us this morning. Encourage us. In Jesus' name we pray. You may be seated. I'm going to use that last song to segue into a few thoughts I have. Um, the word sheep is a word that's really come alive again lately, the world we're living in right now. Uh, politically, people use the word sheep all the time. You dumb sheep following this guy, dumb sheep following that people, following this media, whatever. Sheep are, are real, and sheep are dumb, you know. Sheep are sinners. And sheep are compliers. And we are the sheep of his pasture. How about that? It makes us really dumb and compliant, isn't it? <laughs> but what's cool about being a believer in Jesus Christ, it's good to be a sheep because we need a shepherd. We are reliant upon a shepherd. If you think you know your own way, you're going to be in for a surprise. And you just might find the edge of the cliff. I'm thankful I had a great shepherd that pull me away from that guardrail. I'm glad that he had a uh, further calling and purpose for me. I'm ready to go home anytime. You know, I've lived a hundred lives. I mean, <laughs> I could never stand before the Lord and complain that I got shortchanged and uh, didn't get my money's worth. I've, I've <laughs> lived, anybody knows me here, knows I've lived a hundred lives. I've got ten cats living inside me. So, but we also live in a time that uh, people are using the term sheep for following um, foolishly, uh, ideologies that are uh, not honoring to God, I'll just put it that way. And this isn't going to be a political statement this morning. We all know that this world will burn. We all know this world doesn't deliver. And no matter how much joy we get out of, like the other day, Heidi and I, she's never been to Arizona before, so we did the big loop, and one day it got up early and plowed to Sedona, did a little walking around and and hiking through the little bit backwoods and stuff, and we got in the car and had it all planned out and got the Grand Canyon an hour before sunset and stayed through the sunset. It was beautiful. You know, wow, the earth is beautiful. The majesty of the earth, the Grand Canyon. I told her, I said, we're going to stay for an hour or three days because either just look at it and go, oh, my gosh, you know, you can't take it in, or you hike it for three days and really take it in. But um, so the earth is majestic, and it's beautiful, and it's a good place to live, you know, but it's not our home. Our home is in heaven. Our home is with Jesus. Our home is in the days to come. But while we're here, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to occupy. We're supposed to be seed sowers. Uh, I am a Paul and Ader. <laughs> but I'm bump sh for goodness there. Um, you know, I'm sort of just now sketching out and storyboarding out uh, a memoir. And not because I think my life is over like that. I want to do a memoir, but I don't want to tell... Then I did this, then I did that, then I did this, then I did that. That's, that's not one of what I want to do. Sensationalism sells books, but I want to write a memoir that will be like a, a, a manual that somebody who is 18 years old, like I was in 1970, uh, will pick it up and, and not be able to put this book down. One more. Excuse me, my alarm went off here. Um, and it'll be a, like a manual, inspire them to be a soldier. Because what we need right now is full time soldiers. The first thing I'm going to do this morning is challenge you 
to become a soldier, a true soldier of the cross. You know, um, there's no such thing as a part-time soldier. There may be uh, divisions of military service that are National Guard and stuff like that that are part-time, but you're, you're really truly never, and that's like saying you're a part-time policeman. You know, you may be home watching TV with your kids, but you're on call. You may be a part-time doctor, but you're really not. You're always going to be responding to emergencies and stuff and health um, emergencies. So as a believer in Christ, as a soldier in God's army, you will always be on call. And called to what? That's the next question I have for you. What is calling? Called to what? Some of you are this, some of you are that. Just like the body of Christ. My left arm right now, if it decides not to participate in this morning's service, we're going to have some really interesting songs. And it will sound like this, every song. Because my left arm will not be participating. Just one little arm. You can change the whole service right now. My next song I do for you. My next song, I love this song too. Let me finger picture. Yeah, okay, just one little arm, one little hand even. If it doesn't participate, nothing will get accomplished musically at this point. So don't sell yourself short and think you're not important because you don't play guitar and lead worship or preach like that. You are important. God has a call on everybody in this room, and we need everybody, all hands on deck right now. We are living in a time that a lot of people are coming unglued and freaking out. Unbelief is just oozing out of the sewers. And fear is in the streets. You can read so many scriptures about that. But people are so driven right now by fear. Their decisions are completely crafted daily by their fear and by their unbelief, by their caution. And I'm not saying don't take, you know, uh, precautionary you know, things to prevent from getting diseases or something like that. If you know by somebody's got COVID, probably not a good chance to kiss them. Good choice to kiss them. Probably not a good choice, you know, but... <laughs> But uh, don't live by fear. We don't live by fear. Perfect love casts out all fear. Long before COVID came along, you guys, <laughs> Jesus still said, no man can add one cubit to his life. I can testify that this morning. You can't add one cubit to your life. So all the things you do to try to protect yourself, wash your hands, social distancing, all that kind of stuff, it's all, it's all good stuff. It's all good hygiene. But the reality is you cannot... Extend your life beyond what God has for you. So what do you do with your life? You use it. Your life has been given to you to use. I know this all sounds rudimentary, but I'm amazed at how many people have taken their eye off the ball. How many people have lost their drive uh, to serve Jesus. You know, we. this is, you know, in the Jesus movement, and I'm not going to go back too far to the Jesus movement for this morning, but I was there. Anybody go through the Jesus movement? Yeah, all right. There's, I saw a smile there. Yeah, you know. All the time people are asking me, since I'm an expert in the Jesus movement since I was there, people ask me, like, isn't this just like the Jesus movement right now? No, it's not, you know. And I talked about this the other night, actually, slightly. I said, you know, one day there wasn't a Jesus movement, and the next day there was. And all of a sudden, just worldwide, globally, really, the Holy Spirit was poured out, and revival happened amongst young people especially. It was called the Jesus Movement. The press guy gave that name. But it was a, wasn't an organization. It wasn't a man. It wasn't a personality figure. It happened globally. I met, uh, I mean, Calvary Chapel is known for Lonnie Frisbee and Chuck Smith and all that. But I've met a thousand Chuck Smiths. I've met a thousand Lonnie Frisbee. I've met a thousand love songs. I mean, they were, they were all over. And I traveled the globe and I just couldn't believe it. It was happening everywhere. And um, my thoughts, personal convictions are, God's not going to do the same thing again. People think there's going to be another Jesus movement. Jesus never stopped moving, first of all. Secondly, is that I believe he's going to do something new that we've never seen before. You agree? Yeah. Why would God refry beans for his last crescendo? Why would his soliloquy be something, just a better version, 2.0 version of something done before? Would that get the world's attention? Does he need to get the world's attention? He's going to get the world's attention. And guess how he's going to do it? Through you and me. <laughs> he's got signs and wonders that are going to happen too. He'll unfold his package. But in the meantime, we are the army of the Lord. And it's our responsibility to preach the gospel. So me, sure, there's, it's easy to become fearful. But I've trained for this for 51 years. 
This is the stuff that I talked about in the Jesus movement. Jesus is coming. Blah, 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 blah. I was on the street all day long just pounding the truth down people's faces, you know. And he's coming. And he didn't come. And then the next time he didn't come again, didn't come again. Then all of a sudden the Jesus movement kind of faded out. Then I just kept doing the work. I've kept my hand to plow for 51 years. But what's the purpose? Because I want to see the glory of the Lord revealed. You know, I was kind of kidding with a crowd that uh, Phil Kagan and I were doing a concert in Colorado Springs back in September. And I was saying, don't you kind of want to see sometimes just with all this evil that's going on around us, don't you kind of want to see like the ending of Raiders of the Lost Ark happen? You know, remember where the Nazi soldiers are looking at the Shekinah glory come out thing, all of a sudden their eyeballs start melting, their faces blew up. Kind of want to see that, you know? Just see the revenge of the Lord come upon the wicked, you know? <laughs> that may sound cruel, but I think it'd be kind of cool. So just for a short season. <laughs> But just you just you, you love God so much you want to see him get the attention he's due and the respect he's due and the fear of the Lord will happen. As I always used to use this as a metaphor that you see a car accident, another car going to the intersection, and the car gets sideswiped. People don't just jump out and say, Oh, State Farm, you know, or oh, Visa or American Express. You know, they don't reach for their go to's of natural. They cry out, Oh God. Fools, because they're iniquity, draw near to the gates of death. Then they cry unto the Lord. How many times you see people, you know, and something bad happens? Oh God, you know, they never call on God in their daily life, but it's an emergency they'll call out. So we're living in this unique confluence right now of emotions and disease. Uh, these are just kind of some random thoughts I'm gonna throw out to you. You know, the first commandment that God gave to the children of Israel when they crossed over the Red Sea. If you keep my commandments and my statutes, none of these diseases of the Egyptians. He didn't say just diseases. The diseases of the Egyptians. What are the diseases of the Egyptians? They were the plagues. And for the hardness of heart, if you want to call it that, the things that God was dealing with, the hardness of heart of both the Egyptians and the children of Israel, he dealt with it. You know? And if you didn't obey it, you were subjected to the laws, to the, to the diseases of the Egyptians. And we don't have to be subjected to those things. You know, we can get COVID. It's all right. We can get through it. You may die from it, but God already knew you were going to die from it. There's not one thing we can do to extend our life. You know, he's got a plan. He's already got a barcode in the back of your neck that only he can scan and read. So every day is a gift. I can testify to that. Most of us in this room can testify to that. You can all... Get up here and tell your own story of how you survived something. So we have this option, but it's not an option. It's a commandment. It's an option if you're in the flesh. It's an option if you don't have Jesus as your Lord. He's just your Savior, and, and you acknowledge him. But if he's your Lord, then it's a commandment, and that's to love one another, to love people, to preach the gospel, to go to the ends of the earth if necessary, to proclaim the good news. And so... When I sort of stand back and take a wide look at what's going on today, I think of the fact that, first of all, the Word of God says that God will shake everything on heaven and earth that can be shaken. That's everything. That's you. That's me. That's our systems, our nations. God will shake all. He's promised he will shake all those things. Why is he shaking them? To sanctify them and purge them as far as believers, to make a beautiful bride. Why would God want to have an ugly bride? Why would he, why would he want to have a, a bride of a bunch of people that's doing their own thing? He wants people to love him and obey him and keep his commandments. Interesting that the first thing that happened to the children of Israel was when they went three days without water. What happened? They were thirsty. They began to mumble and grumble, right? Anybody ever mumble and grumble before? You know? Well, it took them... 400 years of slavery, and it took them three, three days of being thirsty to become mumbling and grumbling. They already forgot about what happened at the Red Sea, you know. But it's interesting that they led, that uh, they found a body of water called mata, which means bitter, the Hebrew word for bitter. It's interesting they got there, and the first thing that happened was, can you imagine the scene of being that thirsty? That many people, and animals, everything out in the desert, and they get word there's water from the scouts probably going ahead. 
And they came running back, says, we found water. And everybody just rushes up there. I'm sure they weren't preferring one another. No, no, brother, you go first. No, 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 I insist. You know, let me, I'll humble myself and let you drink. For, you know, I'm sure it's every man for himself, you know. And uh, the thing is, they got there and the water was bitter. If you read this story in Exodus, you'll see that the water was bitter. And they were even more mad. And Moses was con you know, confronted with the situation. And God gave him way out. It was to take the piece of wood and throw it in the water and make it sweet. And that's what we have. Because when Moses threw that water, that, that wood in the water to make it sweet, the transformation took place from bitter to sweet. The transformation takes place from when we are without Christ and full of bitterness and then become believers and confess in our mouth that Jesus is Lord. The water turns sweet. Taste and see that the Lord is. Is he good? Amen. But it's when we take our mouths and confess the cross of Christ is real. That's what turns the water sweet. One of my favorite scriptures I share every place I go, Revelation 12, 11. They, the believers, overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. So one more thing I want to say about the Jesus movement before I move forward is that the Jesus movement actually, despite all the films you might see today or documentaries or high, uh, highly advertised books by authors that are experts on the Jesus movement, uh, I was there, I can tell you this, music with a worm on a hook. Once we got the crowd assembled, testimonies took over. I would stop and testify between songs just like this where I'd bring somebody up. Hey, Jason, come up here and tell us what happened. Jason would give his testimony. And all the people out there in the audience that wanted to get rid of their old lives and become like Jason's new life, those are the ones that came forward. It was through testimony. You know, and I've said it before. I know I've preached it here before. I'd be the son of a lawyer that, uh, you know, you train your witness to stick to the story. That's what my father told me. He was a trial attorney for 38 years. The first lesson he told me about law was train your witness to stick to the story. We should be trained. That's why you come here on the Sunday morning to fellowship. Hear Dennis and other speakers get, come here talk about the Word of God. Hear your morning devotions every day. We're training ourselves to keep going deeper and getting more familiar with the story because we have a plaintiff, an accuser of their brethren, that wants to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to distract you so badly to give a false report because what does a false report do? It has a big hole in the bottom of the boat. It doesn't hold the truth. The truth will always prevail. You know, I watched my dad try several cases, and I thought, what is he doing? He's getting his behind beat up. And then the last minute, he pulled out his trump card of the, all the evidence, and bam! It's just like a, it's like a, a arm wrestling match. It's like he's almost pinned. Or he's over yawning, and I'm like freaking out. What's my dad doing? You know, and you know, so poof, you know, he just delivered the knockout blow with the truth. You know, the truth will always win. The truth is the word of God is the truth. Amen? Thy word is truth. And uh, so I want to encourage you this morning to stand back a little bit, not panic from all the stuff that's going on in our world. Every day there's something new. Higher and higher, we, we love getting all tangled up and all the stuff that's going on. Uh, we're deep diving all the time. I mean, last night she literally took my vitamin Ds out of my vitamins as just a second, I'm not sure we should be taking vitamins anymore because there's a blah, 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 blah going on. <laughs> like conspiracy vitamin D theorist, you know. <laughs> and we, you know, we've been, uh, it's hysterical. So every day we're always, you know, tweaking is like a Mad Max machine. You know, we're just, uh, you know, tweaking, but trying to see what is the spirit saying? You know, what is the spirit doing? So I'm a photographer, and I can tell you that good composition, if you look at a painting in this room or anything else, good composition is, and music's the same way, no more music than photography. You have what's called near field, mid field, and far field. And obviously near field is what's right in front of you. Right now, we're living in a near field world. Man, it's just bam, 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 120 decibel volume, just punching you in the face every day with all the things trying to influence your thinking, and primarily with fear. If you, you know, <laughs> Heidi just uh, moved, uh, after we got married, she moved from Ohio, living in Amish country to where we live in Herman, Missouri now, but we were, I was up there last spring. I was out in this place called Amish Market. It was hysterical. Nobody's wearing masks. They're all walking around doing their normal thing. You know, was selling bread and doing this. And I asked this guy, I said, you know, what's it been like up here, you know, during whole COVID? What do you mean? I said, you know, what's COVID? Uh, we don't watch TV. 
<laughs> you know, <laughs> they're all healthy and fine, not stressed out or anything, just doing their everyday life, milking the cows, getting their bread going. You know? It's just nothing's going to change for them, you know. So we should take a lesson from that. But um, you have mid, near field, midfield, and far field. Did you ever have an experience when you were a young kid when you had a little box camera, one of those Kodak cameras, and you go on vacation, you drive to Grand Canyon, you go, wow, cool, click, 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 click. You waited seven days to get your film back, you know, and then you got it back, and the Grand Canyon's like this big, you know, the sky's like huge, and then the Grand Canyon's like, this little team's like way far away, out of focus, kind of purpley blot on the, on the paper, and you go, what happened, man? In your mind, you're, you saw every saturation hue of the color spectrum, and your photograph came back, it looked like, you know, somebody spit on it. <laughs> and so what is that? It's because it's too far away for that lens. The aperture and the depth of field wouldn't comprehend it, could not take the information in. And so in far field, you've got stuff that's a long ways away. Midfield is reachable, and near field's right here in your face. That's what makes a good composition, because it tells a story. Once again, it tells a story. I'm going to talk that word a lot this morning. The story... The story of Jesus is amazing. There are so many false gods, so many false gods in this world. It's unreal. You may not think of, uh, you may think of all the gods of the past that people bowed down to, but we have far many false gods than they had. Our options from shopping to <laughs> whatever, you know, or Amazon to me is a false god sometimes. I boycotted Amazon for a long time. Because uh, I just thought I'm not going to feed that that uh, Goliath anymore. He's they're, they're they're prospering during this pandemic, you know. I'll, I'll do something else than call Amazon, you know. But we don't realize how many things we are serving all the time, all the idols that we are serving in our everyday life uh, that make us turn our hearts from God. So this may sound like I'm rambling, but I'm bringing us all to a point. So please just try to hang with me here, because uh, we are living in time where it says, Jesus himself said, even the elect can be deceived. So you're prideful if you think that you're infallible and you're not going to have something go wrong. I want to just stop and testify for a second that one of the things that happened to me in this time of uh, my health, you, when you get in that valley, and it is a valley, and it's almost like you can even see the top of the mountains that you're in and the rapids around you just taking you down, the eddy just round and round and round. You start chucking stuff and that you think thought was important. You will do anything to keep yourself alive. And you start, in your inventory, lightening the load. That's why Jesus said the road is narrow that leads to life. Few go by it. And I can just testify that. I mean, I was just ditching stuff right and left, not just physically, guitars or I mean, my house or that, but just in my heart, taking inventory. And one of the things that continually God was purging me of was self-protection. And um, I'm going to just take a second in case there's one person in this room this morning that's plagued with the, uh, I'm going to call it the sin of self-protection. Because self-protection is relying upon yourself, obviously. But it also usually comes from a wound. It usually comes from a wound of rejection. Fear and shame come from the garden. Abandonment, rejection, were dealt with at Calvary. If you're going to write those four things down, fear, shame. Think of God coming to, you know, down to fellowship with Adam and Eve. And they, what did they do? They ran and hid. They were ashamed and they were fearful. And that is two of the dark horses that chase the carnality of man. Abandonment, rejection, were dealt with at Calvary. Jesus dealt with himself. My God, my God, why is that forsaken? I've seen that song to tell us die. Here many times as church, you know, Father, forgive them. They know what they do, but he was abandoned and rejected by his own heavenly Father. So fear, shame, abandonment, rejection feed into this thing that I call self-protection, which is every man for himself. In the end, you will do what you can to keep yourself going, keep your modus operandi going. And you know that Psalm 23, I had a friend of mine call me in the hospital. He said, Paulie, he had this Boston Mafia accent, Paulie. Write these things down. I said, Dave, I can't even see my phone. I mean, how can I write something down, you know? Just write it down. Write it down. Bro, Paul, I tell you, write this down. The first thing he had me write down was, he makes you lie down. He makes me lie down. 
you always thought of that as the as the good part of God. Of oh, it leads me beside these bubbling little brooks and this beautiful little green grass, and you know, it's just a little s- state park, you know. And but the thing is, He maketh me lie down. Is it possible that God allowed that illness to happen? Is it possible that He put me in that situation to get my full attention? Yes, Satan is trying to kill me probably, but also is it possible the Lord allowed it because he wanted my full attention because he wants to prune me. In the Midwest right now, when it starts getting freezing at night, now we can start pruning our branches. So next spring, it'll look differently. And we just prune off bad branches. We prune off the good branches too so you get more growth. We plant a little vineyard, 25 (laughs) little vine plant, you know, uh, little plants, you know, for growing grapes for our salad. We live in a wine country. It's hysterical. We don't drink. We live in a town of 19 wineries and six distilleries. It's uh, all the Germans came over in the 1830s and 40s. And they planted thousands and thousands and thousands of acres of wine. Herman, Missouri is known for its wineries. And uh, it's hysterical. We go around bar hopping to witness to people. And they all try to buy us drinks. We go and drink. And then they'll ask, hi, hey, well, I about buy you a steak. She's a vegetarian. No, I don't eat that. She says, what do you guys do for fun? You know? <laughs> He said, well, right here, we're talking about Jesus. That's what we do for fun. <laughs> but just to take a little side bar one more time, then I'm going to sing some songs. I know I'm supposed to sing this morning, too. Um, this self-protection, he makes me lie down, you know? People don't like that when, when we get in a situation where all of a sudden you're stripped down to not having power. We like to be in control. True? Anybody, anybody honest this morning? We love to be in control. Not for the sake of just that, but no one wants to have uneasiness. So it's just this, this uh, self-preservation and protection. But what I found was God wanted to go a little deeper on me. Things that I thought were dealt with from my youth, some unfortunate things that happened to me as a child from 8 to 14 years old, they all went away when I was 18 when I accepted Christ. And all of a sudden, half a century later, they're like point blank in my face again. It's like, what's going on here, God? You know, and all of a sudden it's like front and center and the real surgery is going to start. It wasn't on my carotid, my returning carotid artery. It was on my heart, heart. And he was going after my heart. He was doing his own surgery on the things that he wanted to get to for a long time. But I had my little system of protecting. And guess what? The wickedest thing of all was I cloaked it all in the name of ministry. Ouch, that hurts. I was married, had four kids. And I look back when the blinds went up in that hospital, when the blinds went up, I called my ex-wife, I called my kids, I called Heidi, I called everybody I knew that I loved. And I just said, I am so sorry. I didn't realize this is the way I do things. And I'm sorry, you know, and you can't be sorry enough. There's no way you can recapture those things. It wasn't a matter of regret or, or um making amends for my own sins, is that all of a sudden you find yourself in a place of humility. And when you find yourself humbled by the Lord and teachable, that's when he starts shaping you and making you more into the son and daughter he wants you to be. Are you Can you receive that this morning? You know, I was supposedly a leader, a pastor, all things. Yeah, I am. But it's not by my own strength. I don't do those things by my own strength. Do it through the power of the Holy Spirit. So, I better stop talking and uh, take a pause there for a second. Uh, last weekend, uh, we were driving to Des Moines, Iowa. I was singing Sunday night. We could go today. And uh, Heidi just, we were riding along down the highway, and she goes, Hey, honey, can I just make a suggestion? I was like, What? She goes, can you sing some different songs? Because you sing the same songs at every concert. I said, well, that's kind of what you do when you're out and you tour and you kind of get a song list and you have, you know, a CD that people can pick up because they like those songs. Do that's kind of what you do. She says, well, I'm really tired of those songs. <laughs> so the next 100 miles of driving from uh, where we were in Bloomfield, <laughs> Iowa, <laughs> to Des Moines, Urbandale, actually a suburb of Des Moines, I started going through my mind of every song that I'd written at least 50 years ago. And that night, I peeled off 13. The first 13 songs were all songs I'd not sung for 30 or 40 years. I just peeled them off one at a time. And she's, yeah, and she sat in the front row like, 
what the heck? Who's this guy? You know, <laughs> you shouldn't hear anything. So, so I'm going to little challenge myself to go back and think of these songs because it's amazing when I play these songs. They're all simple Bible stories. But, you know, they had an anointing on them that changed a generation. I can humbly and honestly say I'm a, one of the handful of ragamuffin musicians that God rose up and, and changed the world. You know, I can I, I change I help change reshape history, you know. I'm not saying it to myself glory, but I got to I got the front row seat. I didn't do anything other than just play my guitar and sing songs and show up. That's all I did was be available. But I got a chance to see nothing turn into something, you know. And fortunately that industry became all about sales and, and uh flesh and in cap presence, whatever you want to call it. I uh, appreciate CCM for what it is, but it's not what I was called to. I was called to, to ministry. So anyway, this was a song I wrote 50 years ago. Joshua, the son of Nun, of the tribe of Ephraim, went up to spy the promised land of God's People's dreams, and he found a land of milk and honey near a brook named a show. And he brought back a good report, and he urged the people to go. Well, the people, they wouldn't listen. And they wept and cried all night Wishing they were back in Egypt Under Pharaoh's plight But Joshua knew differently He knew what the Lord had in mind So he went off to the promised land And he left the doubters behind As Joshua walked on with God, an angel let him know the plans of the Almighty God for the battle of Jericho. And they marched around the city and on the seventh day around. They blew their horns and praised the Lord. And the walls came a-tumbling down Well, the reason for this song is something to behold. Do you see the faith of Joshua in the story I have told? Can you sound your horn and praise the Lord and trust his plan for you? If you can, then praise the Lord. You march on in victory too. If you can, then praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You march on in victory too. Can you sound your horn and praise the Lord and trust his plan for you? Thank you. <laughs> I didn't even see you. Um, what a deal. Think of that. Think of God told you to walk around your problems seven times and blow the horn and praise the Lord and it'll all fall down. You'd think he's crazy, first of all. Secondly, it'd be foolish. What, what can a horn blowing be doing to a massive fortress? You know, the enemy has a fortress of his own. It's well fortified. He is the prince of the power of the air. He's a ruler of this world. 
he himself tried to bring Jesus to his own knees. So he is a fortress of his own. He's uh, an enemy that can be reckoned with. But what a cool thing that we can just literally sound the trumpet. Once again, it's testimony. The trumpet is testifying the Lord is here. And when the Lord, when you testify the Lord, behold, near field, mid field, far field, it all comes into focus because that's who he is. So we live in this situation. I'm going to be conscious of time. Um, we live in a situation where I literally, in the Jesus movement 50 years ago, was surrounded in an envelope of love. It was post, you know, the summer of love in the world, and then I got saved, and I found out what real love was, and all of a sudden it was, we are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord, we are one in you. you know, it's, Everybody love, 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 love. You know, it was all, and it was firstborn love. It was when you have first love for Jesus, you're, you see Jesus in everything when you're a brand new Christian. Do you remember that when you're born again? I mean, I remember I was a brand new Christian. I went to Kmart, and I hadn't worn underwear for like two and a half years. And I thought, you know, maybe I should think about start wearing underwear. It's getting <laughs> sanctified. And uh, I'm literally back in the men's section, and they had this thing back then called Flashing Blue Light Special. And this is, you know, May of 1970. And I'm standing there, and it's 12 pair of underwear for 99 cents. And I'm like, all right. I don't do laundry for like a month because I can wear them 12 straight days, and then turn them inside out, and wear them the next 12 days. It's, you know, three and a half weeks. With the, you know, I see a couple guys acknowledge it. You know what I'm talking about, bro. <laughs> you know, so I saw this as a chance to rede be redeemed and start a new lifestyle of wearing underwear again. You know, and kind of being respectable. Guy, well, the reason why is I wore bell bottoms. I had one pair of bell bottoms that the back right pocket was ripped off, so you could see my butt was walking the road. So I thought yeah, I should, you know, clean my act up and just let people see underwear. You know, so <laughs> I go to the counter to pay for this, and I literally turn the counter into a pulpit. I'm starting going. Do you know that Jesus brought me here right now? Not five minutes ago, not five minutes later. Right now, for such a time as this, to be here to buy these underwear for 99 cents, to get a bargain because he loves me so much, he wants to give me 12 pair of underwear for 99 cents. I find you find anything and everything to exalt the name of the Lord, including 12 pair of underwear. <laughs> you know? And the people in line were like backing up. <laughs> the women were holding their children, children stay away, you know, just we'll got the car now, but we'll be safe, you know. They're, they, they thought it was nuts. I had big, long red hair and a big, bushy red beard. It looked like Moses come down from the Ten Commandments. And instead of two tablets, I got 12 pair of underwear <laughs> on my hands, you know. And, uh, man, I tell you, you know. But what was happening was that I was so full of God's love, I could not stop and tell everybody about this magnificent love I'd encountered. And we are living in a time right now brothers and sisters, where the door is wide open. You may see people cloistering in their homes in fear. This is the time to put the gas pedal down and take good news. We have good news. The world's full of bad news all day long. This is happening. That's happening. That's closed. That's can't do that. Don't do this. Don't do that. We have good news, and it pushes those walls over. It is the sounding of a trumpet. Good news is good news. There's nothing like, if I play it, you know, this chord sounds pretty good. If I play this chord, sounds pretty. But if I play this chord, that's not good news, you know. So we have an exhortation in the scriptures. It's called Beware. In fact, um, I'm going to read you something. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew 24. Just think about this on the way out here. When I was first a brand new Christian, I did not have a Bible. I had a pocket New Testament only. So obviously I had a lot of red letters <laughs> to read from all the time. And um, I met the Lord literally. Actually, my first true encounter with Jesus was standing out on the highway in western Kansas. My Volkswagen camper engine blown up. I got towed 70 miles from, from um, Joaquin, Kansas to Hayes, Kansas to Ben Drawley Volkswagen Motors. And the salesman the next morning dropped me off at the eastbound entrance in I-70, 360 miles from my home back in Kansas City area. And I stood out there from 7.30 in the morning until 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I could not get a ride. 
I could not get a ride. And that was right when a movie out just came out called Easy Rider. <laughs> had a very uneasy ending for hippies. And uh, every other car going past there in western Kansas had shotguns across the back window. I just saw myself as the next hippie. He's going to get my head blown off. And I was just doing everything. I tucked my hair up in a bandana. I had overalls on. I saw that as an advantage. But I couldn't get a ride. And finally, I reached in the top bit of my overalls. And I had a pocket New Testament. I was a freshman at Univers University of Kansas. I was taking a course on the life and teachings of Jesus Christ. You had to have a New Testament. So I got the smallest Bible I could possibly get because, you know, to carry a Bible around as a drug dealer isn't really happening, you know. I was an unlicensed pharmaceutical representative with a Bible in my top pocket. But I didn't want anybody to see it because I was probing for truth and seeking the Lord, trying to find out what truth is. Truth, truth, truth. If you're a child of the born a baby boomer, you went through the, the search for the truth. We were all truth seekers. Today, people don't seek for truth. They seek for self-gratification, instant everything, you know, instant everything. But as I began to read that day, Matthew 6, 33, I, my mind thinks very mathematical. Seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. I saw that as one plus one equals two. If I seek first the Lord and his righteousness, he'll give me a ride. And I was literally on my knees down in the on-ramp after all day long of doing everything I could to get a ride, and a van stopped, and they picked me up and took me all the way to my front door. But on the way, I was asleep. They woke me up, and as I sat on the table, his wife had prepared a meal. If I could go gone to the best five-star restaurant in the world, there it was right in front of me, two butterfly pork chops, you know, green beans, mashed potatoes, and a big glass of milk. That was, I could have, that was my favorite meal. And there it was. God was meeting my needs. He showed me he loves me and cares for me. So I continued to read through the New Testament. I eventually came to this passage, and I'm not going to read the whole thing this morning because it's rather long, but Matthew 24, if you want to read it, we can just pick up actually verse 3. Now as he sat in the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things be? Let's just take it from verse 5. Let me save a little time in verse 4. Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. Before I move on, if you're around the 1970s, we had all these gurus and maharishis and stuff like that. There are many false teachers and many Christs. Today, they come in different uniforms. They mainly come in politicians right now. They try to bully you around and tell you what you're going to do. So you can, many, in many ways, right now you can say they will just try to deceive you through their politics, through their worldly ways saying, I am the Christ, you know, they're the ones. So he says, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See to it that you're not troubled. <laughs> For see, these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows, which might be where we are right now. Then we'll deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. We don't want to read this part. It's here. And you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended and betray one another and hate one another. Then many false prophets. Let's stop there for a second. If there's anything that's in the air right now, it's hate. Hate is just like a fog, a morning fog off a lake. People are being divided in their own families. Bags, no bags. You know, this is the oldest communist. When I was a freshman in college, I took a class on Marxism. And it was a real simple step plan. You get two groups of people to hate each other, start something on fire, and hang some rich people. That's all it took. You know, you got pandemonium. Then you got people, you know, willing to take anything to make the, the, the bad stuff stop, the white noise stop, you know. Eventually, the propaganda beats you down. You just become a slave. You know, and that's exactly what Satan wants to do. He wants to enslave the world to his plan. doesn't matter what world your political politician leader comes out of. That's his plan, is to enslave you. And Jesus came to set us free. Amen? So we are not going to be of those if here this morning that we will not be haters. That many will hate one another. Verse 11. That many false prophets will arise and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound... Hello, the love of many will grow cold. If there's any word you can describe that word lawlessness right now, you know, that's that word lawlessness, disobedience, whatever you call it, literally comes from the same root as the spirit of Antichrist, the son of lawlessness. You know, 
And the spirit of Antichrist, the word Antichrist, is not just against. You think Antichrist, anti-speeding, anti-gluten, uh, whatever. I mean, anti is that people we think of as against. It's more literally in place of. The world wants to get Jesus out of the way right now to replace him with the false Christs. And that's what we're up against right now is the false gospel. They want to push the real good news out of the way and put a false gospel there. Because losses will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. Therefore, you, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by the Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, I'm going to stop there for a second because I want to I want to keep the focus at near field, mid field, far field. You got to warn people sometimes. <laughs> And their song I wrote 51 years ago. Be we children of what you hear and see. Many will come saying that they are me, performing signs and wonders to deceive. Even you that in Christ Jesus believe. and go astray you will know them by the fruits they yield see the harvest being prepared in the field many come and many go many think they know the road to eternity Keep your faith in Jesus Christ. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Many come and many go. Many think they know the road to eternity. Just keep your faith in Jesus Christ. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The word of the Lord came to Joel, the son of Pethuel, saying, My vine is wasted and my fig tree lies bare. There is no joy anywhere. So sanctify fast and call the people together. With all your heart, seek the Lord in prayer. Let her rain spill your golden drops on the church in Israel. Hey, yeah. Let her rain spill your golden drops on the church in Israel. Hey, yeah. 
Fear not, O land, but be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. He will restore that which was eaten away, and you'll know His Spirit is moving. Yes, it shall fall upon all of mankind, and there will be great signs let it rain spill your golden drops on the church in Israel hey, yeah, yeah. let it rain spill your golden drops on the church in Israel hey, yeah, yeah. And it shall come to pass in that day You will be delivered if you call upon His name Don't get caught in the valley of decision For it will be dark, there will be no more sun Then you shall know that the Lord is in Zion Jerusalem will be holy Jerusalem will be holy Jerusalem will be holy There will be a fresh fountain Let it rain Spill your golden drops on the church in Israel Hell yeah Spill your golden drops on the church in Israel. Hey, yeah. Let it rain. Oh, yes. Pour your spirit on the church in Israel. Mm -hmm. Let it rain. Spill your golden So that was another song I wrote in 1972, I think it was. And uh, I'll break that down real quick because it's kind of where we're at right now. Joel chapter 1, if you want to read the book of Joel. Joel chapter 1, Joel chapter 2, Joel chapter 3. Desolation, restoration, and judgment. That's the three chapters that break down in the book of Joel. Desolation, restoration, judgment. Judgment begins in the house of the Lord, which means it starts with us. If he says he's going to shake everything, he's going to be shaken. He's going to shake us. And what is he going to shake us down to? What I just said earlier. He's going to shake us down to be instruments of love. If we don't have his agape love, we're no different than anybody else in the world. I know lots of nice people. I know people that are nicer people than a lot of Christians I know. Because they have good intentions, they have good foundations, good principles, good morals. They do good things. They donate. They, you know, they'll give you your time. But it's not the kind of love that can change a person's life for eternity. Agape love is something you can't fake. <laughs> There's a lot of things you can fake in the Christian life. But you can't fake agape love. You can't fake the power of the Holy Spirit. You can sort of give off a semblance of it. But when it really, the chips hit the, hit the table, when the poop hits the fan, you'll find out what it's made out of. And if you're full of agape love, you will lay down your life. You will go that second mile. It won't be a burden to you. It'll be a natural reaction to what you've been trained to do and how you've been living your life as a soldier for Jesus, as a believer in Christ. True believers will have that. And it may even cost us our lives. We may be martyred. That may be next. We don't know what's coming. But we know someone who does know what's coming. We do know it's at the end of the book, as they say. And we know that the Lord wins. 
In the meantime, what greater joy could there be than to be full of God's love? What greater disappointment could there be than being full of yourself? What greater disappointment could there be than being full of yourself? One last time. What greater disappointment could it be than being full of yourself? What greater discouragement is it to not cross the finish line because you've run out of gas, you know? You will not finish this course without the power of God. Plain and simple. Your best and sincerest intentions will not get you to what God has for you. And that's not to rebuke you or discourage you. It's to encourage you. And we need each other. You can't do this alone. You can't, you can't do this journey alone. I literally, you know, like I said, I took stock of everything. I thought, you know, I'm getting ready to turn 70. I've been single for 20 years. I've had enough of just being a gypsy for Jesus. I need a companion. I need someone. I, I love laying in bed at night. It's not weird. Just reaching my foot over and just feeling how he's put. It's like the greatest feeling. That may sound really simple. I had other things I used to do a lot more. That I found a lot of pleasure in guitars and cars and all that stuff and vintage this and vintage that and whatever. But now that's, I'm, it's not being reduced. It's been exploding to the joy of being able to just feel somebody foot next to me at night. It's assuring there's somebody in the journey with me. So what time do we have? I don't know. What time do we quit? 11 o'clock? I got time still. Am I out of time, Dennis, or am I? Keep going. One more. Keep going. It's all right if I keep going. Okay. I'm going to try to move just one last thing that I want to say. And I feel the Spirit saying to us. Okay. You get a second chance. Take advantage of it. Fool looks in the mirror and walks away and forgets what he sees. Wise man looks in the mirror and reacts differently. A fool builds his house on the sand. A wise man builds his house on the rock. We know all these things. I could just peel off scripture after scripture sitting here right now. But you and I got second chances. That day at Calvary, we all got a second chance. We were doomed. We were destined to be separated from God forever. And for eternity is a long time. So not just a second chance of getting off the operating table, but a second chance, and a third chance, a fourth chance, and a chance every day. It's so easy to be self-protection, as I've been saying today, to take your ease, to protect and guard what you have for yourself. So I want to exhort you. The word exhortation is really important. It's like a warning, like that song, Beware. Beware, children, of what you hear and see. I want to warn you one last time and encourage you at the same time. Don't just keep doing status quo. Don't just keep dog paddling in the deep in the pool. Allow him to raise you up to a new plateau in him. Allow him to peel off the layers of things that are blinding you from what God wants to make you. Uh, you might remember the name Keith Green. So Melody's a good friend of mine. We were talking just, just a, while, you know, a couple years ago when I was just going down. And we had this big, long talk. I was just shoving out, you know, all this information to her. And we're sharing her life and my life and all the things we've been through and knowing her for all these years and stuff. And she says something so profound, so simple. But she said, you know what? Isn't it great that no matter how long we've been following Jesus, 40, 50 years, whatever, you're never too old to be his child. And that's why I want to end with this point. I want to encourage you that you're never too old to be God's child. And what are children? They're dependent, right? And poor children, when they, when I was when they were little, one of the greatest joys as a father ever had was taking the swimming pool. When they were not quite good swimmers yet, and they could 
stay in the baby pool, but if I took money to the big pool over there, they were dependent upon me. If there's any fathers here this morning, I'm sure you had the exact same, exact same back problems that I had. Because I'd take them out in the pool, and once we were out to where the water's like this deep, they'd begin to dig their fingernails a little bit deeper, <laughs> and I'd get out to chest deep, and they're a little bit deeper, and then I would do the loving fatherly thing. I would bend my knees, one, <laughs> two, three, and then hoist them and hurl them in the air to watch the spirit of panic attack come into them. <laughs> I've just, you know, ah! And I know they're going to be all right, and they'd come back into my arms, and I'd catch them, and they'd froth around, splash, and kick and everything, but once they were secure against me, and they knew it was okay, there was a flip, a total flip. And then the words came in their mouth, do it again, daddy. <laughs> and then for the next five hours till sunset, and the pool's been closed for an hour, and there's no snack bar left, and I'm out of carbs, they are just saying it over and over and over again, do it again, daddy, do it again, daddy, do it again, daddy, just one more time, daddy, one more time. It's, they close an hour ago, just, just one more time. You know, that's the spirit of a child, right? Do it again, daddy. Why are we not living the exact same way? Do it again, Daddy. He will do it again and again and again because he loves us. And this, I want to close off this day with a real simple little worship chorus. Take me out of the shallow water where I can stand on my own. Carry me over the deepest part Where I trust in you alone If holding you is a weakness Don't let me be so strong Take me out of the shallow water In your arms Is where I belong Take me out of the shallow water where I can stand on my own. Carry me over the deepest part where I trust in you alone. Holding you is a witness. Don't let me be so strong. Take me out of the shallow water your arms is where I belong. Yeah. Ooh. 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 Try it with me. Take me out of the shallow water where I can stand on my own. Carry me over the deepest part where I trust in you alone. If holding you is a weakness, don't let me be so strong. Take me out of the shallow water in yours. In yours. Yours is where I belong. Oh, come, let us adore. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Christ the Lord. Try it with me. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him. 
Oh, come let us adore him, Christ the Lord. We'll give you all the glory. We'll give you all the glory. We'll give you all the glory, Christ. Lord Jesus, amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Lord, we thank you for this morning, just the uniqueness of gathering around your breakfast table. We never know what's for breakfast when we sit down at your table. You surprise us. Sometimes with a loud, thunderous, boisterous breakfast, sometimes with a sweet meal like this morning, just to sit at your feet, humble ourselves before you, open our vision to near field, mid field, and far field. I thank you for each person in this room. I thank you that your truth is able to knock on our two front teeth without splitting our lips. And that you have the ability to take the words that were spoken this morning, as low key as they were, to go deep into our hearts. That even this afternoon or this evening, or even tonight when the, your head's the pillow, a one little statement spoken this morning, one little verse from a song sung this morning, resonate in your heart cause an echo and the echo will bring forth more faith because you'll receive more of his word more of his spirit more of his truth and father i pray that each one of us will renounce self-protection die to ourselves surrender to the holy spirit for the power of god is in the holy spirit living in us as through us it's not adhering and just living out the truth in our own best intentions and efforts, but it's truly being dead to ourselves. The only remedy for our old nature is death, not, ref not rehabilitation. We don't rehabilitate our old sinful nature. We crucify it. And Lord, we thank you that you can't cast out the flesh and you can't rebuke and repent of a demon. I pray for each person this morning that's being harassed by demonic forces that's being pestered by demons of fear and unbelief, that are being cloaked with the spirit of fear and shame, abandonment, rejection. In the name of Jesus, I stand against you, and we agree as believers for anybody in here that's being choked out by those four dark apocalypse forces, fear, shame, abandonment, rejection. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. You have no power over my brother and my sister in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, be silenced, be gone in Jesus' name. We don't have to yell at you. We don't have to quote scripture at you. We don't have to be charismaniacs. We obey the word of God. In the name of Jesus, we silence those evil spirits that are trying to debilitate faith. And Lord, we choose right now to pick up faith. We pick up the sword of the spirit. We put on the full armor of God. And we stand this morning as soldiers of the cross, as bearers of truth, the cross of Christ. We ask you for forgiveness for being cowards. Your word says a lot about being cowards. We ask for forgiveness for being cowards, for being silent. And now is the time for us all to stand up boldly. The bones that have sinned you and flesh on it, it wouldn't be dead bones laying in the valley anymore. We'd stand up as a body of Christ. And as individuals, we would be bold even if it's a flashing blue light special, we would seize every opportunity to proclaim the goodness, the love of God to a world that's starving and parched. How can we be silent? How can we be silent, Lord? We just right now pray for a spirit of boldness and freshness and first love to fall upon each one of us. That we would not 
not take for granted your presence. Never take for granted your presence. Where can we go to the depths to see the highest heights of the mountain? You are there. Your word is spoken from one point of the universe to the other. There's not one place where you've not uttered your speech. Lord, don't let that be in our hearts. Let our hearts be alive with the word of God and with the agape love and the power of the Holy Spirit. We surrender. We give you thanks. We know that gratitude is the, the, the garden that you put your seed in. Help us to be grateful people, not mumbling and grumbling people, not people that are getting sucked in by the ways of the world right now and sucked in by the discouragement, but help us to have gratitude even as we bow for a simple meal today at lunch. Help us to have gratitude and thankfulness for the way you provide for us. And I thank you, Lord, for sparing my life and allowing me to come back here just two years later and uh, recall your goodness. Thank you for this fellowship. Thank you for Dennis, Sherry, all the leaders of this church. Do all the things that go on unnoticed, setting up chairs, doing this and that. Your body, I pray for this body. In the name of Jesus, we say all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for letting me just ramble in the spirit this morning. Uh, it's all right. It's cool. It's, it's, it's good to have a different way, the meal every now and then, to not just have it be the same. Not that this is the same, but I know that, you know, there's sort of franchise rules of Calvary Chapels, of three opening songs, offering song, 45-minute talking head, closing song, we go home. Okay, so <laughs> that's the package. It's all right, you know. You, you're branded. It's good. You know, but it's good sometimes to just have a fireside chat sit down and talk these things over and, um, and, and take stock of where we're at, focus our lenses, make sure they're cleaned up. And uh, thanks for personally, just let me share my personal life of the things I've been, at, uh, been through since the last time I was here. And once again, appreciate your prayers uh, for during that period of time. It really meant a lot to me, seriously. And uh, we we'll look forward to being with you again someday. If Dennis will ever have you back. <laughs> Thank you. Can we all stand, please? Um, Paul, you are always welcome here. I, now that you are part of his life, you are especially welcome here. Okay, and we just want to make sure, though, that we have more than just twelve pair. Yeah, <laughs> more. All right, that's. I've exposed myself. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll move right along. <laughs> All right. I'm well. Curious for you. <laughs> May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you, lift up his countenance upon you, give you peace, and continue to root you and ground you in love. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, buddy. God bless. Have, Have a great, great day, day, everyone. Yeah.